What's up? Ghost Fictions is here, and we're back again. This is the first part of a story where Issei was the reincarnation of the Kaiju Destoroya. I don't care if that red-haired bitch gets married to Riser, I made a promise to another, and I intend to keep it. After the meeting with Riser, Issei only had 10 days to train for the raiding game. However, on the day he went to meet up with them he heard them talking bad about him. Heartbroken and filled with emotions, the old Issei is no longer alive. This is, what if Issei was the reincarnation of the Kaiju, Destoroya. But before we start, please consider subscribe to the channel and give this video a like. Don't forget to check the description for more informations. Now, let's get into part 1. Third Person Pav. The Abyss. There Issei was, falling down what felt like a never-ending tunnel, all around him was nothing but pure darkness for miles and miles. He was confused since he has been having strange dreams for the last couple of days now, normally he would be dreaming about boobs or being the harem king. But this was different since it didn't feel like a dream, but more like a vision or memory of some sort. This was only more confusing to the brown-haired boy since can't recall having any memory of him falling into a never-ending abyss, looking up now he had absolutely no idea how far he has fallen. Everything around him looked and felt the same, all he could see, hear, smell, taste, and touch were the same. Nothing. Water. Dark. Silence. Cold. Emptiness. Issei. This feeling. I hate it. Issei wanted to scream, he wanted to call out to the eternal darkness and see if he could at least try and get some kind of response. Though he can already just tell that he would be wasting his own time, well he was already doing that by just falling down this black hole or whatever he was in. With nothing better to do, Issei slowly closed his eyes as he hoped he would land eventually. Suddenly, a massive shadow flew over the brown-haired boy, which caused his eyes to shoot open. He darted around the darkness, trying to locate whoever or whatever just flew over him. The feeling of dread washed over him as he could feel his heart starting to beat quickly, this went from calm and boring to horror movie levels of intensity real quickly. Issei. W what the hell was that d drag is that you? Drag. The name of one of the most powerful beings in the world sealed inside him, the Welsh Dragon of Domination. Drake was one of the two heavenly dragons who are dragons with powers said to be able to kill both gods and satans, and are considered to be one of the highest class of dragons. How is a powerful creature like that sealed inside a teenage boy like Issei? Well that is quite simple, that is because Drake is Issei's sacred gear. Also known as God's artifacts, sacred gears are powerful items that are bestowed upon humans by the god of the Bible. A friend of Issei's has stated that certain individuals with sacred gears have grown to become very powerful and influential, and that a large number of the people who have had their names etched into history were most likely sacred gear possessors. Sacred gears vary from the common to the rare, and the unique are known as longinus. However, they all share one similar feature, and that is if they are removed from the owner. They will die in an instant. Issei only knows a very small amount of information about sacred gears, since he can't be bothered to learn anything too detailed. But he gets the feeling that only certain sacred gears have something sealed within them, since one of his friends has a sacred gear, and he hasn't heard any voice coming from it. The brown-haired boy's eyes continued to dart around the endless void that surrounded him, he might not be able to see anything, but the chill running down his spine was telling him that whatever he was looking for. Was close. Very close. Suddenly, Issei heard a low yet very loud growl from above. The boy's pupils became small as he slowly looked up, fearfully taking over his face as he saw what flew over him before. It was hideous, monstrous, and most of all fucking terrifying. It looked like something out of a horror movie, only this one made the ones with Freddy Krueger, Ghostface, Jason, Michael Myers, and hell even Pennywise looking like harmless people. What Issei saw coming at him was easily terror incarnate, a full-blooded monster that enjoyed the suffering of others around it. This was no longer a dream, memory, or vision anymore. No, it was something worse than that. It was. A fucking. Nightmare. Issei watched as the creature flew toward him, its jaws and claws widening open on full reveal. The brown-haired boy wondered if this was gonna be his end if this was gonna be his second death. He can't die, he has to save President from that stuck-up prick, Riser Phoenix. Issei hasn't even become the harem king yet, he needs to complete his goal no matter what. The monster drew closer to Issei whose body refused to move, even if it could where could he even go. The last time he checked, he was still falling into an abyss of eternal darkness. It raised one of its claws to swipe at Issei, the tip was just about to make contact with one of the boy's eye. Ring 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 ring. Issei's eyes widened as he sprung out of his bed, sweat began to run down his face as he started to pant heavily. His ears were filled with the noise of his alarm clock which he quickly turned off because he didn't want to wake anyone up, why he wants that was because he set his alarm clock to go off at 5 in the morning. Though at the moment, Issei had much bigger problems to worry about, such as whatever he just fucking experienced. 
That scenario felt like something out of a horror movie, and an I'm, or rather both at the same time, but more on the horror side. And that monster, it was so horrifying that he doesn't want to remember its face. Issei. Fucking hell. Everyone alright, partner? Issei jumped at the sudden and quickly looked around his room for the source of it, it sounded close. Very close. Wow, whatever you were dreaming about must have scared you deeply. Issei. Who said that? How can you forget me, the one trapped within your hand? The brown-haired boy's gaze moved to his right hand and saw a familiar green gem on it, the same gem that was in his sacred gear, the boosted gear. The voice was also very familiar to him, it was the same voice that he heard while having a strange dream about President and himself getting married. But the dragon interrupted the dream and woke him up after basically crashing his dream, Issei was a little mad, but was also kinda glad that the dragon did that. Issei. Drake. Drake. Indeed, it's me. I see that you finally learned my name, did the Grimmery girl tell you or did you finally learn something? Issei shook his head, he wasn't gonna fall for this obvious trap that his partner was setting for him. The Welsh dragon obviously wants to get the brown-haired boy riled up, but he has something else to worry about at the moment. Issei. I. Didn't think you would be up, I thought you were sleeping. Greg. I was, but I was soon awoken when something started happening to you. This gained Issei's attention, though he had a feeling he knew what the Welsh dragon was gonna talk about. Issei. What happened? Greg. Your heart started beating quickly, at first I ignored it and believed you were having another one of those worthless dreams. Issei's eyes started twitching from Dreg's words, did the dragon have to be that harsh with him? Issei. Gonna pretend I didn't hear that. Dreg. But I was proven wrong when I felt your body trembling in fear, what happened inside that dream of yours, partner? The brown-haired boy scratched the back of his head, he wasn't really sure if he should tell the dragon about what happened. Even Issei himself wasn't 100% sure what the hell he just experienced, it felt off to him. Was it a dream? A memory? A nightmare? Or a vision? Issei just didn't know the answer to his own question, he doubts that Drag would be much help either, since this didn't seem like a problem for a supernatural being such as him. For now, he'll just pretend that everything was alright. Issei. Nothing happened, rough night was a. Greg. I know you're lying. Issei blinked. Issei. Wait what? Greg. Partner, my soul is connected to yours. I can see your memories and know when you are lying or not, and you just told the biggest lie in your entire life. So tell me what happened during your dream? Issei let out a sigh, looks like that plan failed before he could even start using it. Looks like he can't sneak anything past Drag. Also the brown-haired boy doesn't like the fact that the dragon could see all his memories. Doesn't anyone from the supernatural know anything about privacy or personal space? Seriously, the number of times that someone from the supernatural got all up in his grill was very annoying. Issei. I. I wouldn't call it a dream, Drag. Drag. Oh. Then what was it then? Issei. That's the thing, I don't know. Drag. You. Don't know. The Welsh dragon was confused about what his partner was talking about, normally he would simply take a look at the memory and see what was going on for himself. However, something was off about this new one. Drake couldn't access it at all, and all he could see of the memory was nothing but eternal darkness. That is what concerned him since this had never occurred during the dragon's time with multiple hosts, this was caused by someone or rather something. But who or what could have caused this to his partner? Issei. I thought it was a dream but... It didn't feel like one. Drake. Was it a memory or a vision? Issei shook his head. Issei. No, it didn't feel like those either. Somewhat. Greg. I see, but what was making you so afraid? Silence fell upon Issei as a shiver went down his spine, he didn't want to recall that monster he saw. In fact, not even mentioning it makes Issei want to run to his bathroom and throw up in his toilet. But he already can tell that Drake won't stop pestering him unless the brown-haired boy coughs up what he saw. Maybe the dragon has some knowledge about what he saw, after all he was ten times older than Issei, and has more experience with the supernatural. Issei. I was some sort of monster. Greg. A monster? Like one little kids would have. Issei. No. This was no kitty nightmare, the fear I felt when I saw it was something that could only be described as. Real. Greg fell silent as he listened to his partner's words, he could tell that he was being serious with each word spoken, and that is what surprised Drake the most. From seeing all his previous memories, the dragon could already tell that he would love and hate this human, since all he thought about was boobs and becoming the harem king. But this mattered little to Drag since Issei was only meant to be his wielder and face his arch-rival for another round of their never-ending battle against each other. However, for some reason, Drag is actually feeling worried for one of his hosts, which is a surprise, since he never really bothered remembering most of his other wielders' names or what their gender was. 
But his say it was different, the Welsh dragon could feel it within his burning soul. Greg. Could you? Give me a description of this monster you saw. Maybe I can shed some light on what it could be. Issei sighed. Issei. I couldn't see much since it was clouded in darkness, but I did catch a glimpse of maybe two pairs of wings, a long tail, and a horn on its head. After getting this small description, Drake began to ponder his own thoughts. Two pairs of wings, a long tail, and a horn on the head. The Welsh dragons first thought that it was simply another dragon, but thinking more clearly about it. That description doesn't fit any known dragon that Drake has knowledge about. Also, he doubts that it was a new species of dragon, since it hasn't been long since he and his arch-rival were sealed into the sacred gears. This was puzzling for Drake, he has experienced numerous things, and has seen loads of supernatural beings during his time alive. Yet, this was the one thing he couldn't figure out. Drake, hmm, I'm sorry partner. But I cannot seem to figure this out. This surprised Issei, he thought the Welsh dragon would have been able to assist him in this predicament. Issei. Can't you just look at my memory? Drake. I've tried, but I can't see anything but darkness. Even at the end, all I see is darkness and nothing more or less. This brought Issei down as he sighed in disappointment, he truly believed that Drake could have shined some light on this. Yet, it seems that he was also in the dark like the brown-haired boy. What the hell was happening to him, and why was this occurring just before he, President, and the others head off to train for the raiding games? Could it be all risers doing? Issei doesn't doubt it, the blonde prick was really arrogant in his abilities. But if what Issei understands is true, Riser is a member of a noble family of demons that had abilities like that of a phoenix. There was zero chance of what Issei just experienced his doing, maybe it was all in his head. Maybe Issei was just overreacting, and there shouldn't be anything to be worried about, yeah that must be the case. Greg. Actually, now that I think about it. Why are you up so early in the morning anyways? Issei. I. I wanted to get some early morning training in before we head off to President's training area. Yes, the Welsh dragon can recall the Grimory girl mentioning some sort of house that she and her peerage could go to and train at for the next 10 days. He was honestly surprised that the brown-haired boy wishes to get some early training done, not something he would expect him to do. Greg. Are you sure, partner? This isn't like you. Issei deadpanned. Issei. I'm sure, Drake. He looked at his left hand and clenched it into a fist when he had that short battle against one of Riser's peerage pieces. He saw how weak he was compared to her. Issei got taken down in mere seconds, he didn't even stand a chance against her or better yet any of Riser's pieces. He had to get stronger, he needed to defeat Riser and free President from this forced marriage no matter what. Issei. I was weak, Drake. It's time that changes. The heavenly dragon was speechless at his partner's words, but he soon let out a chuckle in excitement. Greg. Well then, shall we get going? Issei nodded his head as he stood up from his bed, he quickly changed into some better clothes and silently made his way out of his room. He walked downstairs, trying not to make so much noise, since his parents and Asia were definitely still sleeping. When the brown-haired boy arrived outside, he took a deep breath and let out a small sigh, seeing that his breath was visible as cold mist. Issei. Looks like the sun isn't fully up yet. Shaking his head playfully, Issei gazed one last time at his home before he turned and started to jog down the streets, feeling the cool breeze wash over his face. He didn't have to go far since he lived in a pretty small town, Kuo was the name of the town. The place was set in a peaceful valley, close to the city of Tokyo. Kuo was one of those small towns that wasn't much of a tourist spot, but it was well known enough to gain some visitors from different places. There were many spots within Kuo, such as a plaza. The town square is surrounded by numerous restaurants and shopping malls, and even has a giant clock tower at the center. A typical park with trees, grassy fields, and ponds full of creatures such as ducks, fish, and who knows what else. A different park with a small playground consisting of slides, chin-up bars, swings, benches, and other things that a child would play on. A gaming center where people could go visit and hang out with their friends, and there was even a carry place right next to it. There was even an aquarium where it housed much undersea life, noted it is small, but has a good atmosphere. And finally, there was a street in the small town that led to many adult-orientated hotels. Because Kuo was a small yet simple town, he didn't have to worry about getting lost, plus there are never any kidnappings within Kuo, because if there was one someone would have easily seen it happening. As he kept jogging, he soon heard something close by which gained his attention. He wondered if it was a stray cat digging into a trash can, Issei wouldn't say that it was not but he never knew. It could have been anything, but maybe he should check it out and see for himself. Besides, he still has plenty of time before the sun fully rises into the sky. The brown-haired boy followed the noise to an alleyway, immediately he was getting both horror and an I'm vibes from this place. However, he shook the feeling off and looked down the alleyway. 
when he did his eyes widen as he saw a very familiar girl getting pinned up against a wall by a fat bastard, Issei knew who that girl was. It was Kaneko. Kaneko was a petite girl with white hair and gold eyes. The front of her hair had two long bangs going past her shoulders and several loose bangs hanging over her forehead, while the back had a short bob cut. She also wore a black cat-shaped hair clip on both sides of her hair. Issei narrowed his eyes, why the hell was she with a fat bastard? Kaneko would never do something like this, for starters, the dude looked like a pervert, and last time Issei checked. Kaneko hated perverts. Well, hate was a strong word. He has seen that she was somewhat warning up to him despite Issei's own perverted personality, she does still punch him from time to time, but that was simply her way of telling Issei she liked him. Also, Issei didn't need to get close to know that the fat bastard smelled absolutely awful, and the scent of the trash that was in the alleyway didn't come close to what Issei could smell from the fat bastard. The brown-haired boy also didn't like the look he was giving her, sure Konko and he wasn't that close, but Issei still cared about her. She was his friend, no matter how much she punches him for acting perverted. Issei. Drag. Drag. As you kids say it go kick his ass, partner. Issei couldn't help but smirk at the Welsh dragon's words, he was definitely gonna do that. Man. I gotta say. You got a cute body. The man licked his lips. Man. I'm gonna enjoy using you. The man started to rip Kaneko's clothes off the white-haired girl struggled to free herself from the man's grip. However, nothing seemed to work, and she knows that she could easily just break free using her devil strength. But that has its downfall since if the man wakes up then he will probably start spreading rumors about Kaneko's unnatural strength. Normally she could just as Ria's to wipe the man's memory, but if he escaped then they might not be able to find him. Kuo may be a small town, but there were a lot of houses so he could be anywhere. There is also the chance he leaves the town and moves to somewhere else, she can't let that happen. She would have to wait for the right moment to knock the man out, Kaneko just needs to be patient. The man chuckled at Kaneko's attempt to break free from his hold. Man. Don't worry I'll be gentle. The man was about to rip off Kaneko's bra, but soon a hand grabbed the man's wrist. Man. What? Both Kaneko and the man looked to see who it was, much to the white-haired girl's surprise, the one who was holding the man's wrist was a very familiar boy with brown hair and brown eyes. They say hi to. This was something that Kaneko did not expect to happen, she didn't think that anyone other than her would be up at this time. She originally came to this place because it was the location of her favorite candy store, since she and her comrades were gonna go to a place o train for 10 days. She wanted to make sure she had everything she needed. That was when she met the fat bastard, he said that he worked at the candy store, and the boss was thinking about throwing out some old but still fresh and really good candy. He told her to follow him and well, she ended up pinned against the wall about to be raped by the fat bastard. She did not expect to see one of the most perverted boys in her entire school show up and save her from being raped, the white-haired girl honestly didn't know how to feel. The say glared at the fat bastard, his brown eyes gazing into the man which allowed him to see some kind of raging inferno within them. The say, What the hell do you think you're doing? Man. I was about to have some fun with this little cut. However, before the man could finish his sentence, Issei decided to put pressure on the man's wrist causing the man to let go of Kaneko and scream in pain. Man. Arg. He glared at Issei who wasn't phased by the fat bastard's gaze, in fact, it was the most pathetic thing the brown-haired boy had ever seen, and that was saying something, since Issei was pretty much the weakest out of anyone in President's Peerage. Man. You bastard. Let me go. Doing the opposite of what the man said, Issei put more pressure on the man's wrist, which inflicted more pain upon him. They say. If I find out that you're trying to rape girls again. I will make you wish the police come and arrest you, do you understand? The man quickly nodded Issei soon grew a small smirk as he grabbed the man's head and slammed him against the wall knocking him out cold. This surprised Kaneko since she didn't expect Issei to have that strength, sure he was no longer a human because he was reincarnated as a devil. But this. This was unexpected. Issei. Fucking bastard. The brown-haired boy dusted himself off as he looked at Kaneko, holding out his hand to the white-haired girl. Issei. Are you okay? Kaneko nodded her head, she took his hand and brought herself back to her feet. Issei soon blushed slightly at the fact that Kaneko's body was exposed, he looked away as he cleared his throat. Issei. Here, take this. He took off his jacket and placed it on Kaneko's exposed, making the white-haired girl blush slightly. Kaneko. Thanks. Issei couldn't help but smile. Issei. No problem, Kaneko. He turned and walked over to the bag that the fat man gave Kaneko. He picked it up and checked inside it, seeing that it was nothing but rocks. He let out an annoyed sigh. Issei. I should have guessed. Closing the top of the bag, Issei tossed it away before turning his attention back to Kaneko who was staring at him. Issei. Looks like you were tricked. Kaneko. 
I see. Why are you up? The boosted gear wielder scratched the back of his head, he wasn't sure how Kaneko will react, but he might as well tell her, since they were on the same side. They say. I was getting some early morning training since we're doing to be training for the next 10 days. Kaneko eyes widen a little, surprised by his words. Kaneko. Really? Issei nodded his head. Issei. Yeah. Kaneko. Is it because you are weak, or you want to touch Rhea's boobs? The brown-haired boy's face went slightly red as he looked away, crossing his arms in the process. Kaneko shook her head, she didn't understand why he cared for girls with big boobs, because to her, they were nothing but saggy bags of meat that get gross when one gets older. Issei. I, I wanted to get stronger, that's all. Kaneko. Really? Issei nodded. Kaneko. Well, thanks again. I guess I owe you one. Kaneko wasn't sure how she was gonna repay Issei for saving her life from being raped. Maybe she'll not punch him for a whole day, even if he does do something perverted. Yeah, maybe that will be what she does for him. It's the least she can do since he saved her, but nothing more or less. Issei smiled at her. Issei. You don't need to do anything for me. Kaneko. Huh. Issei. You don't need to do me any favors, I saved you because I care about you Kaneko, and I will always be there to protect you. Even if that means I would have to go against the world itself. Kaneko stared at the brown-haired boy in shock, her face bright red from his words. Was this really the Issei she knew, the perverted teenage boy that peeped at all the girls in school? Kaneko. Really? Issei. Yes, I meant every word. Kaneko couldn't help but smile at the brown-haired boy, for the first time in a long time she had a genuine smile. Third person Pav. Stop me if you heard this. Worlds will live. Worlds will die. But imagine your every fear every bad decision gave birth to a malformed world of nightmares. Home to the stories that never should be, it's all one big cosmic joke, except no one's laughing on the side. Well almost no one. The Haidu residence. The Haidu household was your average two-story building that had the appearance of something from an anime, besides that there was nothing weird or special about the place. Though anyone would definitely agree that the Hayadus have wonderful taste and structure, plus they got the place for a cheap price. Within the halls of the house, walking toward a bedroom was a middle-aged woman with a young appearance, both her hair and her eyes were the same as her husband and her child which was chocolate brown. This woman was Mickey Hayadu, she was a stay-at-home mother who tended to everything, while her husband Goru went out to work. Sometimes the work she does can get a bit stressful, since she would have so much to do, but for the last couple of days, she has been having fewer and fewer chores. She wasn't sure why she had been getting fewer chores, maybe it was because of Asia. Since they adopted the blonde-haired girl she had been such a sweetheart and had helped so much, she knows for sure that her own son won't do shit. Speaking of her son, Mickey was actually heading toward his bedroom to see if Issei was still sleeping. She does this from time to time just to make sure that he wasn't still up doing anything he should be doing, the brown-haired woman knew that it was 5 or 6 in the morning, but that was still too early. Mickey. Alright, let's see if he's awake or he's actually asleep. Knowing her son and Mickey knows him a lot, he was probably awake by now. She wouldn't be surprised if he was, but he would probably be doing something perverted. Mickey shook her head as she arrived at her son's door, she grabbed the cold doorknob and slowly turned it. She opened a door and poked her head inside the bedroom, like always there was stuff scattered across the ground, such as comics, porno, and other things. However, to her surprise, her son wasn't in his bed at all. Mickey's eyebrow rose as she wondered where Issei could be at a time like this, he wasn't the type to wake up and head to school early. But if he wasn't anywhere in the house then where could he have gone? The school was the only place that came to the brown-haired woman's mind, that was the only answer to this. But for the first time in her life, she could clearly say that she was shocked by something Issei did. Mickey was just at a loss for words. This felt like a dream, her son has never done such a thing in his entire life. He has always said that boobs shall give me my strength, just another thing he gained from his father. Mickey remembers it all too well, she remembers how Issei became the perverted teenage boy he was. Her husband, Goru had accidentally left one of his porno comics laying around when Issei was only a small boy. Issei soon discovered it and instantly took a liking to it, from that day forward her innocent little boy had been corrupted by the vile evil known as porno comics. Mickey. Wow. Goru is never gonna believe this when he wakes up. I'm Skip brought to you by Kratos fighting the Egyptian gods. Puo Academy. Named after the small town that it was in, there isn't really much known about the school, other than the fact that it was originally an all-girls private school. At some point, Kuo Academy changed into a co-ed school, and a new school building was made. The academy had several different divisions such as the primary division, high school division, and college division. This splits up the students who are in different divisions, meaning there are first, second, and even third-year students that attend the school. 
The third years are sometimes known as senpais by the lower years, showing respect to them for their skills and their knowledge. Walking through the gates of Kuo with a white-haired girl next to him was Issei Haidu, how he went from doing some early morning exercise to walking to school in under an hour or more is quite a mystery. Maybe it's because unlike what others say, the brown-haired boy is actually intelligent and planned ahead by bringing his school uniform with him, so he could quickly change into it. Pineko came with him since she still owed him for saving her from being raped by some fat bastard, honestly, she still was surprised that Issei of all people came to her rescue. But she had a feeling that walking through the gate at the same time with him was a bad idea, basically, all the other girls in the school hate Issei for being a pervert, and seeing him with her would just make things worse for him. Though, Kaneko doesn't want to leave his side. It was like there was a small voice in her mind, telling her to stay by the brown-haired boy's side no matter what. This was something that had never happened to Kaneko before, so she wasn't sure how to respond to such a demand. The students that had arrived at Kuo early started to notice both Issei and Kaneko were walking together, so they began glaring at the brown-haired boy. On the boy's side. Boy 1. Damn you Haidu. Boy 2. First Riaz, then Akeno, then Asia, and now Kaneko. Boy 3. Why does he get to hang out with the mascot? Boy 4. This isn't fair. And on the girl's side. Girl 1. Haidu is walking with Kaneko. Girl 2. How dare he. That fucking pervert. Girl 3. I bet he's blackmailing her likes he's done with Rias. Girl 4. Why doesn't he just die? Issei flinched a little from the last comment, hearing that word brought back unpleasant memories, memories that he has been trying to forget about ever since that fateful night. The night Issei lost his life at the hands of his former girlfriend, Yuma, or rather Rainer, who turned out to be a fallen angel sent to kill him because she and her allies knew that he had the boosted gear. Issei can still recall the pain he felt during that moment of dying, every part of it down to the finest detail. How could he not forget something so unbearable to the point he wanted to scream and beg for it all to stop, but knew that it wouldn't? The brown-haired boy ignored the harsh words and gazes that his fellow students were giving him, they didn't really affect him anymore. He had experienced them since the beginning of his school year, at first, he was bothered by it because it was annoying, but now he doesn't really care. Pineko nudged him. Pineko? You okay? They say. Hmm. Of course, why would I be? Pineko's gaze moved to the other students, Issei instantly got what she was talking about and simply waved it off. Issei. Oh, them. Nah, I'm not bothered by their words or stares. Pineko. Why? Issei let out a small chuckle. Issei. What could they do that you haven't already done? I mean, you literally beat the shit out of me and my friends that one time. The white-haired girl knows what Issei was talking about, her class had just finished sports and went to the changing rooms to change back into their school uniforms. Due to her enhanced senses, Kaneko sensed Issei and his two perverted friends' presence, exposing them by revealing their hiding spot which was a locker. A poor decision on the trio's part since they had no way of escaping from Kaneko's wrath, though she may have gone a bit overboard and nearly punched Issei so hard in the face that one of his eyes almost went blind. Then again it was their fault for being horny teens and peeping on girls while they changed, Kaneko was still surprised that they haven't been expelled yet. Kaneko. You three deserved it. Issei couldn't help but chuckle a little at Kaneko's words, he knew that she was correct about him and his friends deserving a punishment. But did it have to be such a brutal one? But he wasn't really surprised that it came from Kaneko, the white-haired girl really did hate perverts with a near-burning passion. Issei. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Kaneko. Good. Well, this is certainly a surprise to see. Both Kaneko and Issei perked up before they turned their heads in the direction of voice and was greeted by a familiar side of the person who Issei respects and hates a little. Tsana Shitori or rather her true name Sona Sitri, a beautiful young bespectacled woman with a slim figure, black hair styled in a short bob cut, and violet eyes. Tsona was the student council president, the student council helped share students' ideas, interests, and concerns with teachers and school principals. They also often help raise funds for school-wide activities, including social events, community projects, helping people in need, and school reform. The black-haired girl was also one of the two devils that had Kuo as their territory, she shared the place with Issei's master, Ria's Gremory, or as he calls her president, since she was also the president of the Orc. aka. The Occult Research Club. Both Issei and Kaneko respected Sona, mainly because of all the hard work she does on a daily basis. Issei. Morning, Sona. No surprise that you're here. Kaneko waved. Sona. Of course, I have to greet the students and make sure they are not doing anything that could cause harm. Issei. I feel like that cause harm part is directed toward me. This made the black-haired girl raise a small eyebrow. Sona. What makes you believe that, Haidu? 
Hineko proceeded to pull out a very long list from her pocket, surprising both Issei and Sona, because they wondered how something so long managed to fit into something so small. Sona. How did you? Hineko. Don't ask. Not wanting to ask any more questions, Sona shook her head. Things sure have been getting very strange over the last couple of days down, but nothing too unusual, since she was a part of the supernatural. Strange things happened all the time, Sona could name a few, but that would probably take up both Issei and Kaneko's time, and she doesn't want that to happen. They both had a big day coming up, they would be off to train for the next 10 days, in order to defeat Riser Phoenix and free Arias from the forced marriage she was in. Sounds easy enough to do, but in reality, there were so many problems that Sona could easily identify. However, at the moment she needs a little bit of extra help with something she needs to be delivered to the principal's office. She then looked at Kaneko. Sona. Kaneko, could you assist me with something? Kaneko. What is it? Sona cleared her throat. Sona. You see, I need something delivered to the principal's office. Normally I would do it, but the object is quite heavy, and even though I'm a devil heiress. My strength is nothing compared to a rook's. The white-haired girl crossed her arms. Kaneko. So you need me to lift it? Sona nodded her head. Sona. Yes, that is what I'm requesting. Kaneko sighed a little before turning her attention to Issei. Kaneko. You go on ahead to the club room, I'll meet you there. Issei nodded his head as he watched both Kaneko and Sona walk off in the direction of the gym, the brown-haired boy wondered what this thing needed to be delivered to the principal's office. The black-haired girl said that it was heavy, so it also had to be pretty fragile, Issei knew a thing or two about fragile items like vases, statues, and even very old things like music boxes. Maybe it was something from a museum, something from ancient times like during World War I or even more ancient. Issei. I wonder what it is. Greg. Aa, I wouldn't worry about it, partner. Issei. Yeah, you're right. Since Issei had arrived at Kuo earlier than he usually does, maybe he should head over to the club room and see how President and Akeno were doing. The brown-haired boy had a feeling that they were there since they were the ones making preparations for the training. He couldn't help but feel excited to see President and Akeno, especially their massive boobs. But besides that, he just likes being around them since they are very nice to be around. Issei smiled as he started to make his way toward the club room, his hands in his pockets, and ignoring the hateful glares he was getting from the females and males around him. He was used to getting so much hate that it doesn't really bother him anymore, though there are times when he wished he didn't get hate for just existing. So what if he peeped at girls and so what if he always talked about women's boobs, he was just a teenage boy who had urges, and what was so wrong with that? If you ignore those things then there was absolutely nothing wrong with Issei Haidu at all. But there was actually something wrong with him, he can't stop thinking about what he experienced last night. It wouldn't get out of his head, he felt like whatever it was is squeezing his heart with its claws. Issei felt like he could hear it whispering to him, saying that it will make him its or whatever. He'll have to let President know about this because Issei trusts her, maybe she can figure something out for him cause so far. Issei can't trust himself to solve this problem. Issei continued walking for a little bit before he arrived at his location, the brown-haired boy smiled at the side of the building before him. The orc or rather the occult research club, was originally abolished due to the lack of members, but Issei had heard that upon her entry into high school, Ria's Gremory and her best friend Akeno, revived the club as the president and vice president. Issei didn't know much about the building, but there were some theories that it was the old Kuo school building before it became co-ed. Probably the reason why a new one had to be built since there was zero way that the new students would be able to fit inside such a small building, if they somehow did manage to do that, then things would probably become bad, well worse than it currently were. They say. Damn, I can't believe I used to be creeped out by this place. The brown-haired boy made his way up the stone stairs until he found himself at the door, he grabbed the doorknob and turned it. Issei made his way into the building, walking through the old and dusty rooms. He didn't understand something, why the hell were the other rooms and halls full of dust and cobwebs, when the club room itself was clean. It made no sense to him at all, but there was no point in trying to figure it out right now. Issei needs to stay focused. He made his way upstairs and down another hallway, walking by more cobwebs and dusty rooms. Issei paid no mind to any of these as he approached a room that had the label Occult Research Club on it. Though before he actually got to the door, something felt off to him for some reason. For some reason, Issei's senses were telling him not to go toward the door. He decided to ignore this feeling as he walked up to the wooden door, hearing two familiar voices on the other side. So, Rias. What's the game plan when he arrives at the house? That voice belonged to Akeno, the vice president of the club and Rias Gremory's queen piece. Issei wanting to hear more about their conversation because he was curious, secretly looked into the room and saw the two girls. 
The Keno was a beautiful young woman with a voluptuous figure, very long black hair, and violet eyes. Her hair was tied in a long ponytail, reaching all the way down to her legs, with two strands sticking out from the top and sloping backward, with an orange ribbon keeping it in place. Bria's wasn't too far off, she was also a beautiful young woman with a voluptuous body, white skin, and blue eyes. Her most distinctive feature is her long, beautiful crimson hair which Issei believes she had inherited from one of her parents. Issei was thankful to Ria's because she brought him back when he was just about to die, sure it cost him his humanity and eternal life of slavery, but if it meant that he could live once again. It was worth the trade-off. The brown-haired boy would do anything for Ria's, and that wasn't his perverted side speaking either. He genuinely wants to be by her side and assist her in any way he can possibly, even if that means he has to die for her. Wait, die for her. Remembering that word sent a shiver down Issei's spine, he started to become the words that a certain someone said to him. Words that he has been trying to forget. Brainer. Would you die for me? Those words. Those were the last words that Issei felt before his stomach was pierced by his former girlfriend's light spear, she was a fallen angel that was using him to make him drop his guard. Issei doesn't want to remember the pain he felt, but he knows that it will always be within him. Scared into his memory. He let out a small sigh as he started to calm himself down, he should be thinking about such things right now. Rias. It's simple, Akeno. We win and finally get rid of that useless human. When Ria said those words, it caused Issei to blink for a second. Issei. Wait, what? He wasn't sure he heard the crimson red-haired devil girl correctly, did she just say get rid of a useless human? The Keno. Oh, what do we have to Ria's? I wanted to play with Issei before we take his gear. Ria's. You can mess around with his dead body as much as you want after we kill him. The brown-haired boy's eyes widened as he swore he felt his heart stop beating from what he was hearing. They were talking about him, they were calling him a useless human. More importantly, they were talking about getting rid of him, no, this can't be right. This had to be all in his head, Ria's and Akeno would say such a thing. Would they? Sure, he knew the two can be harsh to enemies, but Issei was a part of the peerage. He was family to them. Issei. T this has to be all fake. Akeno giggled slightly. Akeno. I still can't believe he fell for everything like a moth to a flame. Ria smirked as he brushed her hair, the expression on her face was one of pure pride and arrogance. Issei could feel his blood going cold as a ringing noise began to fill his head, the sound was so loud that it was actually drowning out Drag, who was secretly listening to everything and trying to get his partner's attention. The Welsh dragon was angry, no he was fucking furious from what he was hearing right now. However, he will deal with Ria's and Akeno later because he needs to snap Issei out of his trance before something happens to him. Drag. Partner. Ria's. Of course it was easy, we knew that he had the boosted gear, and so did the Fallen. We just allowed them to do all the work for us, I ordered my familiar to give Issei the flyer and now. The dragon's power is mine. The flyer. Issei remembers that flyer, Ria's familiar was the one who gave him the flyer before his date with Raynor. The brown-haired boy's pupils became smaller as it all started to piece together for him, Ria's let him die, so that he would serve her, since she quote-unquote, saved his life from a near-death experience. She knew about the Fallens and could have taken care of them, she could have prevented his death from happening. But she didn't do that, Ria's instead decided to sit on the sidelines and wait for the right moment to make her move. Greg. Partner, snap out of it. She lied to him. Greg. Partner. Used him. Greg. Partner. Manipulated him. Greg. Come on, snap out of it already. Issei slowly clenched his hand into a fist and gritted his teeth, he clenched his hand so hard to the point that his nails dug into his skin and caused blood to pour out. The once shock, surprise, and horror emotions that filled him had now been replaced by new and more dangerous ones. Rage. Anger. Hatred. How could Issei not feel these emotions, he had been lied to by the person who saved his life and found out that she had been only using him since he was the wielder of the boosted gear. Ria's never cared for the brown-haired boy or his life, all she cared about was power and herself. This wouldn't go unpunished, Issei will make her pay for what she has done. He will make her fucking pay. Issei started to growl as his eyes which were now filled with betrayal, anger, hatred, sadness, and other types of emotions, changed from chocolate brown to a more blood-red color. Issei. She. Will. Pay. Greg. Issei. Snap out of it. The Welsh dragon was starting to get very worried about his partner, but he was also confused at the same time. With this level of negative emotions, Issei should have unlocked a form sealed within the boosted gear known as the Juggernaut Drive. But the fact that it wasn't activating was a surprise to the dragon, though there was also another huge problem. Because Drag was connected to Issei, he could sense his life form and can feel it. Slowly dying. 
The heavenly dragon immediately believed it was the dragon fall sickness, something that many dragons had to suffer through. How it works is when a dragon's mate either betrays or dies, the dragon's life force will slowly begin dying, stripping them of all its strength to the point it can't move. The sickness is extremely painful and when it's all over, the dragon shall die. The only cure to it is either moving on or getting a new mate, which isn't as easy as it sounds. Drake knows that because he used to be friends with a dragon that suffered the dragon fall sickness, the poor lizard couldn't let go of the past and ended up dying. However, with his say, it was. Strange since the crimson-haired devil girl and her friend weren't his mates. Issei shouldn't be suffering the dragon fall, which means that whatever was happening to him was something far worse compared to the dragon fall. Issei ignored Drake's words and slowly turned, making his way away from the door. He needed to go somewhere, to a place that he was familiar with. The place where it all started. I'm Skip brought to you by me reading Dragongod Astareth, the betrayed heavenly dragon of Remnant book. After leaving Kuo Academy, Issei wandered the streets of the town for a little bit before he came to his destination. It was the location where everything began, the moment the brown-haired boy lost his life and became a devil. The Kuo Park. The Fountain. Issei made a promise to himself in secret, he told himself that he would never come back to the fountain. No matter what. However, it seems that he has to break his own promise because he needs to do something in the location, something that shall assist him in the future. Rage kept on filling the devil boy's body, manifesting itself in the form of a dark red aura. The aura was so malicious and threatening that any animals in the park started to run for their lives, prey or predator. It didn't matter what it was, it ran for its life. Issei continued ignoring the pleads and begs that were coming off his partner, his eyes now permanently changed from brown to blood red. He gritted his teeth, slowly they started to change from regular human teeth into sharp fangs. In anger, Issei unleashed a very loud scream which soon changed into a mighty thunderous roar that shook the very heavens themselves. Third person Pav. They say that one bad day can bring out the worst in someone, though regular people's bad side is nothing compared to what is about to be unleashed. Watch in fear as one bad day turned a once lovable person into something monstrous, a beast of death if you will. Ten. Ten days. Ten long fucking days. Issei Haidu has been missing for 10 days straight, with no sign from anyone that knows the brown-haired boy, not his friends, his family, or the occult research club. The news of the disappearance has already spread across the entire town of Kuo, causing mixed feelings among people. A few people are worried about the boy's safety and hope that nothing bad has happened to him, while the other half simply doesn't care about Issei Haidu. This negative response has been growing strong since most of them are coming from the girls of Kuo Academy, the same who Issei used to peep on. The boys on the other hand want to know where their fellow comrade has been taken, all the boys at the school share a special coat together. And they feel like they broke it. Both Issei's friends are worried sick, it has taken a huge toll on them to the point that they either don't come to school or just do nothing. This is the shocking part, they don't even acknowledge the girls around them or their bodies. The teachers have tried their best to snap the two out of this funk, mainly because their grades are slipping. However, they simply don't care about any of that. It's worse for the brown-haired boy's parents, they are truly heartbroken by their son's disappearance. They have been blaming themselves, thinking that he ran away from home because they were terrible parents to him. Asia comforted them as best she could, but not even the power of her sacred gear could heal the injury they were feeling. The blonde-haired girl also missed Issei, he treated her so kindly and loved her like a little sister. Viba was also saddened by Issei's sudden disappearance, he really felt like he and the brown-haired boy were becoming the best of friends. Even if he doesn't agree at first. Hineko had to be the most upset by the fact that Issei had disappeared, she still never got to truly thank him for saving her from being raped. The white-haired devil girl has tried endlessly to think of the answer, what could have happened to Issei? Where could he have gone? People don't just disappear like that. At first, she thought it could have been the work of a stray devil or fallen angel. Though that idea soon goes out the window when her king, Rhea said that there had been more sightings of fallen or any strays in Kuo for the last couple of days. No doubt it was because of Grafia's arrival 10 days ago, Grafia was the maid of the Gremory household and Rhea's brother's queen. She is far more powerful than Rhea's or anyone in her peerage, her mere presence alone would send shivers down anyone's spine. She is known throughout the underworld as the strongest queen after all, and she has rightfully earned a title such as that because her command over ice can chill anyone to the bone. When Grafia heard about Issei's sudden disappearance, she was surprised because she remembered that the boy was very loyal to Rhea's, so he wouldn't be the type to just up and betray her. She informed her king and he was very worried about this, never in the history of the devil race had they gained a powerful ally like Issei, and now he is. Gone. If one were to ask how Rhea's felt about all this, she would easily say that she was having mixed emotions. On one side, she was upset that her sweet pawn was basically stolen from her. 
Issei belonged to her, he was her pawn, and someone dared take him away from her. On the other hand, she can't help but feel like that Issei felt her. On purpose. She didn't want to agree with this feeling, but it wouldn't get out of her mind. The crimson red-haired devil girl had so many questions flowing through her mind, but she had more important things to worry about at the moment. She had to focus on the upcoming raiding game, now that Issei was no longer around to help them, Ria's had to work around this and try coming up with another plan to defeat Riser. Currently, Ria's was sitting at her desk trying to come up with a new battle plan for the raiding game. As she was thinking, she couldn't stop thinking that Issei betrayed her and left the peerage on purpose. She let out a sigh of annoyance. Ria's. Damn it. Why, Issei? Why did you leave? Do. Knock knock. Ria's. Huh. Ria snapped out of her thoughts and looked up from her desk, someone was knocking at her door, but who could it be? It couldn't be Akeno or any other member of her peerage, she told them to get some rest since the raiding game was tonight. Ria's. Come in. The door opened to reveal someone very familiar to Ria's, her childhood best friend, Sona Citri. Ria's. Oh, Sona. I didn't think you were still here. Sona. Well, the student council still has a lot of paperwork to do. But I am sure my peerage can handle it. Ria's giggled. Ria's. Just hope it doesn't end up like that one time. Silence was all that came from Sona as she started to lose all her color, remembering the mountain of paperwork she had to do one time. There were so many that she believed that someone simply copied and pasted the same words onto sheets of paper, because that is what it felt like to Sona. Mimi flashed back. Sona and her peerage were making their way back to the student council room, the principal of Kuo said that they had to sign some paperwork. Subaki. Um, Sona. Sona. Yes. Subaki. How much paperwork did the principal said we had to sign? The heir of the Citri house pondered the question, she didn't even know herself which was a first since she would always know. She felt like there wasn't gonna be much, maybe a stack or two at most. Sona. Not sure, but I'm sure we'll be fine. However, when they arrived at the student council room and opened the door. Their pupils became smaller as they saw the absolute mountain of paperwork that they had to sign, there was so much that it basically covered Sona's entire desk. Sona. Oh no. Mini flashback end. The black-haired girl groaned as she felt like her soul wanted to leave her body, trying to save itself from the torture that was signing all that paperwork. Sona. Don't remind me, just please. Ria's giggled. Ria's had to admit, it felt nice seeing that Sona had to suffer through something. The crimson red-haired devil girl was always the one that suffered something when they were growing up, such as this forced marriage, or the brutal training she had to go through to even get the hang of her magic, the power of destruction. Sona. So, you still coming up with a new battle strategy? Ria's nodded her head. Ria's. Yeah. I wasn't planning on coming up with another one. Sona. It's because of Issei, isn't it? Ria's sighed. Ria's. Yeah. Where did he go? Sona. I do not know, Ria's. But I am sure that wherever he currently is, he is perfectly fine. Ria's nodded as she looked away from her childhood friend, she then scowled in anger which Sona didn't see, because she was looking away from the black-haired girl. Ria's. I don't care if he's alright, he's better off dead for all I care. I need his power. Meanwhile with Issei. Pain. Agony. Anger. Rage. Hatred. Those were the emotions Issei Hayaju, pawn of Ria's Gremory, and the Red Dragon Emperor was currently going through right now. Those were the emotions that were tearing the poor boy from the inside out, like a dying animal that was poisoned by a predator. Ignoring the last three emotions, the other two were exactly the same things that Issei felt when he went on a date with his girlfriend Yuma, or rather. Rainer, the fallen angel. The brown-haired boy remembers that pain all too well, how could he not since he was still alive throughout the entire fucking thing. He remembered Kayleen on the ground with blood flowing out of his wound like a raging river, his mind going a million miles per hour. Crimson red covered his hand. Blood. His blood. He can recall his hands trembling as his body went into shock. His chest burned as it heaved trying to take in air, his lungs were desperate to try and keep the poor boy alive. Yeah, like that was gonna happen. His chest burned like he was just stabbed by a fire poker. The pain was so bad that he wanted to scream out in agony, but knew that it was pointless, since no one would hear his call. The tears that welled in the corners of his eyes, he remembers how he begged not to be killed because he had so much to live for. What response did he get from that beg again? Oh, yeah the burning sensation in his chest was replaced by nothing but cold. He wanted another chance, he desperately wanted a second chance. He received his wish, but now he wishes that it never happened in the first place. Betrayal. Manipulated. Lied. How could Issei have been such a fool? How could he have fallen so low by his perverted nature that he failed to realize that he was only being used by a power-hungry bitch that only revived him cause of his sacred gear? 
She knew, she fucking knew all along that the Fallen were gonna attack him and she did. Nothing. Sona would have never agreed to such a thing, so she not only lied to Issei. Rhea's also lied to her own best friend, someone who basically grew up with the crimson-haired bitch. If she did know about it, Sona would have done everything within her power to make sure that Issei never died. She would have explained everything to him and maybe. The brown-haired boy would have had his old life back. But now, he was forced to serve someone who did not care about him whatsoever. To make things even worse, Issei truly believed that Rhea's would have been the one for him. He felt it deep within his soul. He thought that maybe if he served her enough, maybe she would be proud of him, and maybe they could have gone on a date together. She could have become his one true girlfriend, sure that didn't mean he would give up on his dream of becoming the harem king. But now, fucking that stupid dream. It doesn't matter anymore, what is the purpose of a harem when you could easily get betrayed by one of the girls? They say. How did it come to this? How did my life from a normal high school student turn into nothing but a living hell? What was the purpose of living anymore, there was nothing for Issei to live for anymore. He can never go back to being his regular self, he will forever be known throughout the world as Rhea's Gremory's pawn piece. He doesn't want that. Issei doesn't want this anymore, he can't take it anymore. He wants it all to end. It needs to end. He wants to die. 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 Yes. Yes, that is the answer that Issei has been looking for. That is how he shall be set free from this eternal cycle of pain and suffering, how he shall free himself from life itself. Since his peaceful life went to absolute shit, he might as well just end it all, since there was nothing for him to live for. Issei. Finally. I shall be free from this hell ho. Issei soon stopped himself as he started to remember something that he promised someone, a promise to a certain white-haired devil girl, when he saved her from being raped by a fat bastard. When he flashed back end. Issei. You don't need to do me any favors, I saved you because I care about you Kaneko, and I will always be there to protect you. Even if that means I would have to go against the world itself. Mini flashback end. Issei. Kaneko. The brown-haired boy can't forget about her, he made a promise to her. He told her that he shall protect her no matter what, even if it meant going against the entire world itself. He can't simply die and break a promise like that, that wasn't like him at all. He was better than that. Issei always kept his promise, either it came from his parents or his two friends, he always kept it no matter what it was. Though there are a few promises that Issei will not keep and he has done something like that, that is a story for another time. Either way, Issei was gonna keep his promise to Kaneko and protect her no matter what. Issei. If anyone harms her, they will answer in blood, answer in fire. The Red Dragon Emperor slowly opened his eyes to reveal his chocolate brown eyes. But this didn't last for long, eventually, they changed into something more. Darker. Issei chuckled. Issei. What has been created, at times, must be destroyed. What is destroyed, will rise and fall, and rise again. The crimson red glow engulfed Issei who didn't seem to be in any kind of pain from the light, in fact, it seemed to be just what the boy wanted to happen. A savage grin formed on his face as the light grew bigger and brighter. The light shined throughout Kuo Park, hiding up in one of the trees, was some sort of glowing red cocoon that appeared to be made out of blood. It pulsed and made a low yet loud enough sound that almost resembled a human's heartbeat, it was very freaky, and would scare people away from the sight alone. Just then, the top of the cocoon started to rip, and from it rose something. Powerful and dangerous. Meanwhile. In another part of the world, Nepal to be exact stood one of its several mountains. Nepal was known to have some of the tallest mountains in the entire world, some that reach higher than the clouds. Sitting on the edge of one of the mountains was a powerful being, a cute young girl with long black hair down to her hips and gray eyes. Her ears differ from a normal human's as they have pointed tips, although her long black hair makes this feature difficult to notice. Her dark gray eyes have reptilian slitted pupils. Her attire consisted of a black gothic lolita fashion. This girl was none other than Aphis, the Auroboros dragon, and the infinite dragon god. She was one of the two most powerful beings in the universe, if she wanted to she could easily wipe out all life on the planet with a single attack or destroy the planet itself. Aphis's appearance wasn't really her true appearance, this was only one of many she has taken over the countless years. One of the previous forms she has taken was an old man with a long white beard, something that would terrify a lot of people for obvious reasons. Who the hell would want to see something like that, it would only creep them out. Another form was a small purple snake with grey diamonds, another form that many people did not prefer since it was a snake, and that would only leave people mainly human scared stiff. This gothic appearance was yet another one of her many forms, she has gone through so many that no one is sure if there is an exact number of them. Office was minding her own business, staring off into the distance. She had many things on her mind, specifically the idea to kill someone who took her home away from her. 
The office may be a dragon, but she did not live in any type of cave like a regular dragon would. She lived in a very special place, a place that only two beings have ever gone to. The Dimensional Gap. The Dimensional Gap is the gap that exists between all worlds, considered a void world. It was an endless chaotic void, where in every direction, there is a mix of iridescent colors. It's office birthplace, her home until it was taken from her by another being. She wasn't the only one to be born within the dimensional gap, there was another who was born there along with the Ouroboros dragon. Nothing can survive within the dimensional gap without magical, demonic power, or other protection. Anyone without such protection dies within a matter of seconds after being exposed to the nothingness within the gap. One would ask why would Office want to live in a place like that? It is really simple, she enjoys the absolute silence that comes from the gap. The office soon perked up as she sensed something, it was a powerful aura. It had been a very long time since she picked up on any kind of powerful one, the last one who has ever had this type of aura was Elohim, God of the Bible, Lucifer Morningstar, and Baca Red. However, the aura she was sensing was something completely different. She couldn't really describe it, the infinite dragon god felt a feeling that she has not yet felt for even discovered yet. Fear. Awe. She didn't know what this feeling was, she had never experienced such a thing in her entire lifetime. The office. Interesting, I have not felt an aura this powerful for quite some time. As she focused on the aura, she picked up something important about it. The aura was that of a dragon, but it belonged to a dragon that she has never met before. The office has seen every single dragon that existed in the world, from the hatchlings to the fully grown adults, the dragon kings to the heavenly dragons. She has seen them all. This one though, it was something else. Office. What kind of dragon could have such an aura? It's not Draegor Albion, nor any of the Dragon Kings. This aura is something else, very interesting. Back with his A. Now that the top of the cocoon had been ripped, the being that was resting within it could finally feel the warmth of the sun once again. That being was obviously, Issei Haidu. After coming to Kuo Park, he went through a type of metamorphosis so to speak, which changed him quite a bit, but it also drained a lot of his partner's strength. Greg won't be waking up for a long while, but that mattered little to the brown-haired boy, since he obtained new abilities through his metamorphosis. And? He knows exactly where to test them out. Issei grew a sinister smirk, revealing his very sharp fangs that rivaled any predator on planet Earth. This was gonna be so much fun, he was fully rested and energized from his 10-day nap, and now he needed to burn that energy off, wasn't very good for him. Issei. Let. There. Be. Carnage. That's it guys. That's for watching and supporting us. Part 1 is over. See you in the next part.